All right, hello and welcome to the Clark Fork Coalition's virtual field trip, um, non-lethal beefer conflict resolution. We are live now on Zoom um, and I'm excited to see names popping up, people coming in as attendees. Thank you for joining us today. We have over 100 attendees today and so we'll be taking a short minute here at the start of our virtual field trip on non-lethal beaver conflict resolution to let people get logged in. Um, attendees, I'd like to let you know I have the comments open um, for a few minutes while people log on. So please feel free to jump into those comments, um, say hi, tell us um, who you are and where you're from. We'd love to know who's logging on today. Wow, lots of people coming on. I'm going to give us just a minute here um, as we get started and we are going to um, go live on Facebook. So I'm going to click for just a second and get that set up. Welcome if you're logging on to the Clark Fork Coalition's um, virtual field trip non-lethal beaver conflict resolution. We're giving a few moments here for people to um, log on. and for us to go live on Facebook. Awesome, I see that people are already jumping into the Q&A. That's amazing. Um, we have over 100 participants logging on today. And so if you um, have a question you know you wanna answer, you know you want us to answer, go ahead and put that in the Q&A feature. Um, and we'll do our best to get to those. If we are unable to get to all the questions today, um, at the end of this event, I will be sharing some information on where you can get um, answers to those questions, as well as um, the, the, oops, a little trouble with Facebook, as well as contact information for our speakers today. All right, it looks like we still have a few people um, logging on. And it looks like um, if people are trying to join us on Facebook that we are not able to get that live stream up today. So we apologize for that. Um, we can make a recording available to you um, later on. All right, so again, welcome to the Clark Fork Coalition's virtual field trip, um, looking at non-lethal beaver conflict resolution. We are live today on Zoom. Um, my name is Lily Haynes, and I work for the Clark Fork Coalition here in Missoula, Montana. Um, I'll be hosting our event today and the conversation of the incredible work being done to increase the tolerance for beaver across the landscape. To start, we'd like to acknowledge that we are hosting this event today from the cultural homeland of the Salish and Kootenai people. And we honor the path that they have always shown us in caring for our watersheds for generations to come. Um, to get started, I'd like to share a little bit more about the Clark Fork Coalition. The Clark Fork Coalition is a river conservation nonprofit here in Western Montana. Our mission is to protect and restore the Clark Fork watershed, which covers 14 million acres um, and supports over 350,000 people. Today, we're going to be talking about beaver, a critical keystone to healthy watersheds throughout the country. And especially, we'll be talking about their interactions with human infrastructure, which can often lead to conflict. The Clark Fork Coalition, in partnership with the National Wildlife Federation and Defenders of Wildlife, has launched a project to address beaver conflicts in our watershed using non-lethal resolution methods. Our program goals are to build a greater tolerance for beaver on the landscape, to reduce beaver conflicts, and we aim to sustain healthy watersheds in Montana through providing outreach and education. Um, in this webinar today, you are going to see videos and photography from the field showing you the diverse approaches to mitigate damage and see just how these non-lethal techniques are working. Um, one thing that's really exciting about this work, um, this conflict resolution work, is it's increasing application to management of beaver in the Western region 
and really as a nationwide thing. And so today we are joined by an amazing lineup of presenters and they are from all across the country. Um, we will be hearing today from Mike Callahan. Um, Mike is based out of Connecticut and he's the founder and director of Beaver Solutions and its education counterpart, the Beaver Institute. Um, and together those organizations look to share knowledge and resolve um, beaver human conflicts in ways that maximize the benefits that beavers contribute to the environment. We'll also be joined by Aaron Hall, who's the aquatic biologist for Defenders of Wildlife in the Rockies and Plains. Um, he's based out of Denver, Colorado, and Aaron has a long career of working in Western watersheds, studying everything from rare fish to freshwater mussels to our furry friends, the beaver. We'll be joined by my um, friend and coworker, Elisa Chott, who um, is the Beaver Conflict Resolution Field Technician here at the Clark Fork Coalition, and she works to implement on the ground conflict resolution. We'll also be joined by Tori Ritter, who is the non-game fish and wildlife biologist for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks Region 2. Um, he's worked on beavers throughout his master's at Montana State University and his career at Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Um, and so now I would like to welcome all of those panelists up to um, share their screens. I'll shop or to turn their videos on. I'll stop sharing my screens. Hello, everybody, and welcome. So good to see you. Um, and panelists, or I mean, not panelists, attendees, we, we wanted to hear from you too. So I'm gonna let all of our panelists um, introduce themselves, tell you a little bit more about their connection with Beaver work. But while I'm doing that, I am going to launch a poll that asks a little bit about your experience with Beaver conflict resolution and um, how you, what is, what's bringing you out to this virtual field trip today. And so I have launched that poll. You should see it. Um, I'll leave it open while these guys go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, and Mike, maybe we'll start with you, followed by Aaron, Alyssa, and then Tori. Okay, thanks, Lily. Yeah, my name is Mike Callahan, and uh, I've been working with beavers for over 20 years here in the Northeast, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, over the, those 20 years, I've managed over 1,700 beaver conflicts with some of the devices I'll be talking about today. So I look forward to it. Hey everyone, I'm Aaron Hall, aquatic ecologist with Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I've been with Defenders about five years as an aquatic ecologist here in the Rockies and Plains. Uh, Defenders is a critter-based organization. Uh, so we care about protecting native wildlife and natural landscapes. And since I'm an aquatics person, uh, you can't care about aquatics and not be interested in beaver. So we've been, like everyone else, increasing our efforts to work with beaver and encourage them to be in the landscape for all the amazing things that they do. I'm happy to be here today with everyone else. I'm Alyssa Chott and I work for the Clark Fork Coalition and that's in partnership with Defenders of Wildlife, Aaron Hall and Sarah Bates with National Wildlife Federation. And they hired me last year to start a pilot project addressing beaver concerns here in Western Montana and using these non-lethal devices to help landowners live with beavers. And so this is our second season and we've gotten projects off the ground, but we're very grateful for the input and support from all three of those organizations. And I'm Tori Ritter. I'm with uh, Montana Fish, Life and Parks, the state uh, fish and wildlife management agency here in Montana. Um, I started with Fish, Life and Parks doing beaver surveys out in some of our wildlife management areas and then uh, did a three-year project on beaver dispersal and settlement site selection in the context of beaver restoration. And then since then got hired on permanently with Fish, Life and Parks and I've continued to have the privilege of being able to work on a lot of different beaver projects, including partnering with uh, Alyssa Chott and Clark Fork Coalition on some of this beaver conflict stuff. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'll be at kind of the end, sort of covering the broad scale, sort of 30,000 foot view of, of where this conflict stuff fits in with overall beaver restoration and beaver management. So thank you for having me. 
Yeah, thanks for being here, Tori. Awesome. Presenters, thank you so much. We're really excited. I know everyone's really excited to hear from you today. Um, a few notes to our attendees. We do have the comments closed <clears throat> during this webinar. That is to encourage you to use the question and answer feature to ask questions. Um, and that will just help us kind of curate and make sure that we're getting to everything that needs to be gotten to. So panelists, like I said, we're really excited to hear from you. I have our poll results up right now and I'm gonna share those. So everybody should be able to see um, those poll results right now. So to the first question, what is your current level of experience with BeaverCon? resolution. We have some landowners on here who um, are experiencing beaver conflict. It looks like a few experts, but a lot of people who are really interested in learning more um, as far as motivation for joining, um, some real interest in starting to use non-lethal conflict resolution in their work and just learning more about those um, the issue in the management of beavers. So that's awesome. We will get to all those questions, hopefully give you what you want. Um, but right now I would like to start our tour. And so Mike, I'm gonna invite you to share first. Panelists, if you can um, please mute your mics and Mike, that'll give you the virtual space for all yours. Um, attendees, remember to use the question and answer feature go ahead and enter those at any time. And we'll have a few minutes um, after Mike shares before we move on to answer some questions. So, all right, Mike, I think you are up. All right, um, sorry, I uh, messed up with the, <laughs> all right. Uh, here we go. The. Here we go. All right, is that up now? Yep, it looks like you are sharing. All right, sorry about that, for everyone. Okay, so wasting valuable time. <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna talk about uh, beaver management, and I'm hopefully going to uh, give you some good resources that you can use. We won't get into any real detail, but I do want to mention about beaver dam benefits. There's so many benefits ecologically and for humans uh, directly and indirectly. And so that's really the goal why we want to keep these critters around. They're a keystone species and very important to uh, have on the landscape. So there's a variety of issues though that they can cause. You know, property owners who have good habitat for beavers can experience flooding um, you know, of structures, roads, you name it. And so we'll be talking a lot about uh, those types of things. And you know, over the 20 plus years, we've been working for a variety of uh, landowners and, you know, but predominantly uh, highway departments because as we'll s talk about the uh, road culverts are a particularly attractive location for beavers to dam. Uh, most of you are familiar with the first four options here on the list. So I'm gonna really focus on the water control devices also known as flow devices because they're the most cost-effective long-term um, and you know, environmentally and humane way to manage these problems. So whenever possible, these are the best ways to uh, manage beavers. We, as we'll discuss, there are times we can't keep beavers where, where they're causing problems, but most of the time we can use these flow devices. There's four different types I wanna talk about. Um, the first one, the pond leveler pipe is used in freestanding beaver dams to control the water levels. And the last three are, uh, good applications for man-made structures that we need to protect, whether it's a road culvert or a dam spillway. So the first one, the flexible pond leveler, it works very well. And one of the reasons is very simple. What the, the, uh, it's designed so that the beavers can't detect the flow of water into the pipe. And without, when they swim by, this cage keeps them far enough away from the pipe that they don't feel or hear the water flowing. And then we set the pipe at the level that in the dam that we want to keep the pond. And that helps to keep 
the flooding from uh, causing problems. So this is what it looks like when we build it and we float it out into a deep area of the pond on these pontoons and sink it into the deep spot. And then you'll see the, the pipe lays on the bottom and, and then we dig a trench down to the level that we want the water to be maintained at. And then it doesn't siphon, it flows by gravity. So water will pour out whenever the uh, pond level is higher than the bottom lip of the highest point of the pipe. And here's an example of one we put in where we actually had to lower the water level almost three feet because there was an access road for the utility that was had almost three feet of water on it. And many years later, that pipe's still doing its job. And as you can see, the uh, access roads nice and dry and accessible. So the, these work well. Um, they, and so now I want to talk more about uh, man-made structures with road culverts. Uh, there's different ways to protect them. So one, you know, when a beaver plugs a road culvert, the water has nowhere to go and it can quickly become a serious safety uh, issue. So we want to, one way to protect it is with what we call a keystone culvert fence. And that is very effective at protecting the culvert because to a beaver, a road culvert is like a hole through the road bed, which is like a dam to the beaver. So for a little bit of work by plugging up a road culvert, the entire road bed becomes a pond. So that's why they're real attracted to these spots. They're smart that way. They'll take advantage of what what's available that will give them the biggest pond for the least amount of work. So the keystone fence turns the culvert which is current which would be the easiest spot to them for them to dam into the hardest and there's three main reasons why that happens one is the long perimeter of the fence usually the perimeter of these fences are 30 to 40 feet so obviously that's a lot more work than plugging a pipe and so they will tip the beavers will typically choose another place upstream or downstream to make their dam the other uh, second reason is that if beavers want to dam on the fence, they will usually start damming right next to the culvert where the sound and the feel of the water moving is the greatest. But as they dam on the fence, it's pushing them further away from the area that they want to plug. So that discourages them. And finally, when possible, we like to make the far end of the fence at least double the size of the culvert diameter. What that does is if the beavers are determined and they start damming on the fence, the opening is getting wider and wider the further out they dam. So the water flowing through the sides of the fence is decreasing the further they go out. So the more they dam, the less stimulus there is for them to dam. And if you make the sides of the fence 12 feet long, that's generally plenty long enough where the beavers will get discouraged. Uh, if you make it too small, they'll, and they get out to the corner of it, then they'll dam around the whole thing. So making it the right size is important. Here's an example where the beavers have this beautiful big wetland up here from a dam, but they still kept going after these culverts. And so we put this uh, trapezoidal shaped fence on the, uh, the, on the culverts and the beavers have been leaving alone and they're just uh, maintaining their wetland immediately upstream. Now you can't always flare out the sides because you want to keep water around the entire perimeter or else the beavers will just dam off land. So here we will contour the fence to the shape of the channel so that we have water all around it. And so when the beaver come in, they'll come close to the culvert to start damming and therefore it'll, be, it'll discourage them. I don't know if you can see here, there's a little passageway. There's an and that's for to help wildlife get through. Fortunately, beavers don't like to leave the water with sticks, go up on land, and then go down back into the culvert to plug the culvert. They'll do it to travel, but usually not to uh, plug a culvert. So that's a nice quirk of their behavior we take advantage of by allowing some passage so turtles and other animals can get past these fences and it reduces the risk of roadkill. 
another way to protect culverts, which is actually my favorite way, is with the fence and pipe device. And what's nice about it is that we are allowing the beavers to dam on a small fence at the culvert, and then we're running a pipe through. So we're controlling the height of the dam from the beginning and the location of the dam. The limitation of this device is that we have to have a minimum about three feet of water depth with, uh, for the pipe to work. So that's true for any of the pond leveler pipe because if the water got too shallow, then the beavers might feel the flow of water going into the, uh, in through the fencing and then they would bury that whole cage there. So uh, basically what we want to do is uh, if there, you can have three feet of depth, then we'll use the pipe. And here's a example where beavers are plugging up this culvert and flooding the road. And so we put this fence to keep them away from the culvert, but it's not big enough to discourage them from damming on it because they feel the water going through it. So sure enough, they dammed on it. Whoop. Let me go back there. Sure enough, they dammed on it. And uh, then once they had it all dammed up, the pipes kicked in and the pipes are carrying the water. So uh, the beavers, as you can see, they're lodged up there. They ha are maintaining this nice wetland, but the culvert's staying open. If there was a huge storm or, or runoff, it would go up and over what they dam here and through an unblocked culvert. The, the last type of uh, flow device is what we call a diversion dam. And this is nice because it's something anyone can do and it's cheap and easy. And basically what we're doing is giving the beavers a better place to dam than the culvert. We use, we'll put a fence uh, 10, 15 feet in front of the culvert, uh, maybe put sticks or leaves on it. Not that dissimilar from what are called beaver dam analogs. We're starting a dam for the beavers. And if we just back up the water a little bit, then the beavers will work on that fence rather than the culvert. And so here's an example of one where we just encourage them to dam out here. They can maintain the, uh, you know, have their pond, but then they'll just use the culvert to travel through. They don't have a need to plug it once they have their wetland already because of this dam. So the, when done right, these are very successful. Here's a graphic of over time, the orange flow device success, you know, mid nineties or better. Whereas where we have to remove beavers, the new beavers move in. And so usually within a year or two, most sites have beavers again, and we're right back where we started from. So, but there are limitations to using these devices. If it's a very high flow, that can be an issue for either to having enough pipe capacity to handle the flow or for debris and, and fences have to be uh, built very ruggedly. And there are ways to do that that I don't have time to go into right now, but that is a concern. Um, and sometimes we just built things in a floodplain that uh, there's just no room for the beaver to have a dam without causing flooding of a septic system or a road or whatnot. So uh, in those, those circumstances, I'll recommend removing the beavers. But here in Massachusetts, where um, it's the third most densely populated state, three out of four times I'm called to a spot, I'll be able to recommend the devices rather than removing the beavers. And here's some uh, approximate costs for here. Trapping, I'm told, uh, by Tory, significantly lower cost in Montana, uh, like $300 plus or minus. So um, your prices would vary, but that, just to give you a ballpark of what it costs out here. Uh, I want to touch, touch briefly on a study we did, uh, came out last year, over a 20-year study that, where we looked at 55 sites in one town, and 12 of those were trapping sites, and it definitely saved the town a lot of money by using the flow devices versus trapping the beavers, but they also uh, benefited from a lot new wetland acreage, and at a conservative estimate of uh, ecological services per acre, you know, the town's 
benefiting from, you know, about $2 million worth of ecological services for free from the beavers building these new wetland complexes throughout the town. You know, and here's an example of one of them where the herons have a rookery and, you know, storing water, purifying water, that sort of thing. So it really is a great win for the town or any, you know, anytime these devices are used. And that study can be downloaded on the Beaver Institute website. And uh, finally, I want to uh, just finish up with uh, the Beaver Institute has started a, this year a beaver initiative in the state of Connecticut where we had funding to train professional flow device installers and we're helping financially to uh, incentivize installations for property owners to reduce their costs and that's uh, going really well and ultimately our goal is to find the funding to do this on a national level so hopefully coming to Montana before too long so uh, with that you know we we do offer self-help uh, training videos and also a professional training program that Alyssa has been in um, and so she's a great resource there in, in uh, Montana you'll be hearing from her shortly so in summary you know whiz through sorry it's so rapid pace but uh, a lot about flow devices and uh, the benefits of uh, using the flow devices from the Connecticut study and the uh, our goals to hopefully expand the uh, Connecticut Beaver Initiative and feel free to come to our website beaverinstitute.org uh, take a look there's a lot of good information there as well as the self-help and professional training information so with that I'd just like to say thank you all for listening in awesome thank you um, Mike so much sharing. for sharing and Mike, we did have a couple um, questions there that I would love to have you um, address a couple specific questions. Um, so somebody asked, what are um, some good minimum lengths for the long side of the keystone fences? Do you have any guidelines for minimum there? Yeah, generally a minimum about 12 feet is good you know it it can vary if the water's deeper it can be shorter but if in one one foot to two feet of water we usually like to go 12 feet out and that's a six inch by six inch mesh concrete reinforcing mesh that we use and that allows a lot of debris to go through uh, leaves and stuff but they do have to be cleaned off uh, we usually check those a few times a year so that beavers don't uh, dam on that debris and, and a similar question, Mike, what about um, a minimum height for that fencing? Well, that's a good question. Typically, we want the fence to be 24 inches above the water level. You know, if it's too short, beavers will ramp up on it and get over it. But uh, tw two feet seems to be enough where that will discourage them from doing that. Awesome. And kind of a last one on that design question. Um, do you have any recommendations for areas that have low or unpredictable flows, such as those areas in the desert southwest um, for devices that work well in that situation? The only, um, most of the devices work fine. The, the one issue I've seen in low areas um, is that if this, the water in front of the culvert dries up, then the and if you put a fence on the culvert, then there's not water surrounding the fence. So when water starts flowing again, it may only be coming in through a small section of the fence. And that's something that the beavers will plug up. So, uh, you know, that is the main drawback I've seen with that fence, the fence system is that if you have an area that is going to dry up, it could be, uh, there's a chance not that that could fail that way. And therefore, use, if you can, using a fence with a pipe would be better because that won't, the pipe will stop flowing if the water's low and their beavers won't be attracted to dam on the, on the pipe. Awesome. There's a few more questions. We'll try and get to those ones that came in for Mike towards the end, um, but we want to make sure we give everybody equal airtime. Um, and so right now I'd like to, um, Aaron, if you want to pull up your um, video and we'll get you up here. I have in the chat attendees. I know you can't, um, 
can't enter in there, but I did put up a link for more information about Mike's work. You can be, visit the um, beaverinstitute.org. All right, Erin, we'll turn it over to you um, to share a little bit about some projects that Defenders of Wildlife are working on. Great, just sharing my screen here. Uh, yep, we can see it. Perfect. All right, well, hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. So I'm just going to cover a little bit of what's happening here in Colorado. And again, it's all the same idea of what's happening up in Montana that Alyssa is working on. So we're really just trying to encourage uh, people to have more beaver on the landscape for all the amazing things that they do. Um, so just to remind ourselves of why we're doing this, you know, this is, this is what we want. We want a nice, healthy stream, a healthy riparian zone, you know, Lots of complexity, lots of different wetland types, a meandering stream. You know, this, this is what we're trying to get to. And this is a stream that has a lot of beaver in it, so it's super healthy from that perspective. Uh, but right downstream is a bunch of human settlements, you know, that have basically removed the beaver. So we're just, we're trying to get back to, you know, this healthy riparian environment that we see in this picture. So I'm just gonna go through two quick examples of the types of projects we're working on here in Colorado. And uh, as Mike already alluded to, you know, most beaver conflicts fall into some pretty broad generalized general categories. So what we see a lot here in Colorado and also in the West is, you know, we see, you know, tree felling and, and flooding are the primary issues. And, and as Mike has discussed, you know, both of them have fairly straightforward solutions. Um, but I also think it's important to put everything in context. So this is a site uh, up in the mountains here in Colorado. Uh, it's a homeowners association who got in touch with us last year uh, and they have just noticed an increase in beaver activity on their lands, uh, an increase over their historic and, and you know some new dams and some new trees being taken down. They're concerned about the dams uh, flooding out some of their houses and they're concerned about the trees coming down because they, they don't have a lot of aspens up there in their neighborhood and the aspens that they do have are you know ornamental and they like to look at them and they're right next to their houses so people are you know concerned from them uh, and, and the beaver were starting to take out a lot more of them um, but again back to the context of this site so directly upstream of this site is just beautiful beaver habitat there's tons of beavers tons of dams tons of lodges etc so you know it's it's important to note that they could trap those beaver out of there if they're if they wanted to but again as mike alluded to it would be kind of a constant trapping effort um, and you, you're always going to have beaver there. And then similar to downstream, I just wanted to play a video of what it looks like downstream. Downstream, let's see if this works. There we go. This is some drone video of what it looks like downstream of where the dams and everything are going in. And you can see this is just, you know, super healthy, super nice mountain stream habitat, lots of complexity, lots of meandering streams. You can see a big beaver pond over here on the left. You can see some new beaver activity over here on the right of that channel. And you know, this is, this is what they're dealing with up there. There's just so much habitat and so much of it high quality habitat that, you know, even if they wanted to trap beaver out of there, they would never successfully get them all. So it really does lend us to, uh, to a coexistence or a, a flow device or whatever type solution for this particular land. Again, you see this pond over here with a huge beaver lodge. You see where the beaver have been foraging all these little pathways. It's just beautiful habitat up there. And fortunately, the, the landowners you know, really wanted to find a way to live with the beaver and they had been sporadically trapping throughout the years. So there you go, just a quick overview of the context for this site. And let me flip back to the PowerPoint. There we go. So like I said, they've been doing, they've, you know, it's, it's great beaver habitat. They've had beaver there for a long time. So they've been kind of intermittently trying to do things, but, you know, trying to do them 
sporadically or incorrectly, you can see <laughs> these are some pictures that I took when I first went up there. You can see that they've, they've used three different types of fencing at various times to try and protect their trees. You know, this one all the way in the left here is installed properly. This fencing in the middle is, is too small and too tight on the tree. And this fencing in the right is actually chicken wire that they put right up against the, the trunk of those trees when they were young. And it actually girdled a lot of those trees, cut off the circulation of those trees and, and killed a couple of them. Uh, so it was a bit of an effort to get that fence off of that batch of trees. Uh, and, and also, like I said, they've done some inter intermittent trapping at this site again throughout the years. And, and they were really just looking for a more permanent solution for the beaver and, and really a, a cheaper solution as well. So uh, what we ended up doing at that site is as far as the trees coming down, we just put some nice new uh, fencing up uh, around their ornamental trees uh, near their houses and um, stake those in the ground and, and that'll be great. Um, there's a big groove of aspen kind of closer to the water that they were concerned about that the beaver were getting into. So we just fenced that entire grove out. Uh, the beaver won't be able to climb up over this uh, and that'll protect that grove of trees that you know all the residents like to look at. Uh, we also did some sand painting of trees, so mixing latex paint with sand and painting the barks of those trees. And uh, just like us, when the beavers start chewing on that, they get that gritty feeling and then they kind of stop. So we used kind of a whole bunch of solutions here uh, for the tree cutting side of things. And then to be honest, on the flooding side of things, it actually wasn't an issue. Uh, by the time I got up there to look at the site, the beaver were building, you know, down on the stream, which is pretty far away from any of the houses, and they were just never going to build dams big enough to, to get any flooding that would impact the houses. And the residents were super happy to hear about that. So it's actually pretty easy, straightforward solutions uh, at this site. Okay, I do another example. And, uh, and this one's a little different in that uh, I actually have not been directly involved in this. And that's actually one of the goals of, of our work here in Colorado. Uh, so this is a site up in the town of Breckenridge. Um, the town of Breckenridge had some beaver issues in their culverts, so they hired a very experienced contractor to come and build them a, a flow device there. Uh, this is what it looks like at the end. It's, it's beautiful, it's big, and uh, as far as what I've heard from the town, it's functioning great. Uh, and again, the goal behind this from our, our standpoint is, again, to encourage people to live with beaver, and we're doing that through what we call our incentive program here in Colorado. So we're actually, we reimburse the town for a portion of the cost of installing that uh, flow device, even though Defenders was not directly involved, the town went through a contractor. And for me, that's great. I mean, that means that we're able to kind of scale this process up a little bit more and maybe have a bigger influence than we otherwise would if I need to be, you know, hands-on on every site. And this is just the, you know, pamphlet that we have which describes the program that we give out to landowners, you know, and it says right up front and, and, you know, on the front page, do you have a beaver problem? And if so, like we can help you fix that and we'll pay for part of it. And, and that's, you know, we've had really great response for this. And here's the inside of the pamphlet again, like you don't need to look at the words or anything. It's just, you know, here's the general problems. Here's the general solutions, get in touch with us and we'll figure it out. And that's the take home message. So those are kind of the two examples that I wanted to go over. Um, again, we, you know, we're hands-on on some and we're trying to incentivize other projects and it's all getting at that big picture of just like, just have more beaver on the landscape, you know, for to benefit the wildlife and to benefit humans as well. There we go. Awesome, thank you, Aaron. Um, we have a question kind of specific to one of those projects um, with regard to the HOA who is having beaver problems. Were the residents okay with understanding that to save their aspen, um, it comes with that maybe unesthetically pleasing fence out? Or what was kind of the conversation around that with those homeowners? Yeah, exactly that conversation. I mean, there's a trade off there of protecting the trees you like to look at, but then you have to stare at a fence. But I mean, to be honest, once we got the new fences installed and everyone saw them, they look great. And after you see them for a week, you don't even notice them anymore. And, and people found it much nicer than looking at their kind of hodgepodge of old fences that were randomly done and incorrectly and at various stages. So the landowners were actually pretty happy with it. Awesome. Thanks for sharing those. Um, if you have questions that haven't been answered, just so that you know, we are holding on to those. We'll try and get to them 
um, here at the, um, we'll try and get to those questions here um, at the end, but we wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to speak. And so Alyssa, I believe you are up next if you wanna pop onto the screen. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so um, and do you want me to share, are we starting with your video? Please. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here while Alyssa, Alyssa talks. Um, and this is a video. Alyssa, if you want to, I'll pop myself off a video. Um, but if you want to introduce this. Yes. So this was a kind of overview of some of the installations we've done here in Western Montana with our pilot project. And Britt Faulkner from Defenders of Wildlife was good enough to throw this video together. and. Um, yeah, this will just give kind of a virtual field trip of some of our installations and our project goals. In 2019, Clark Fork Coalition, Defenders of Wildlife, and National Wildlife Federation started a pilot project to increase tolerance for beavers in western Montana. Our goal is to keep beavers on the landscape where they are beneficial to ecosystems while working closely with landowners, agencies, and conservation organizations to address beaver concerns in a non-lethal manner. By helping landowners to tolerate beavers where they are appropriate and increasing understanding of the important role beavers play in ecosystem health, our watersheds will be more resilient. Hi, I'm Will McDowell with the Clark Fork Coalition and we're working on a beaver conflict resolution project. We're in the second summer of work. The first year we did pilot projects and those projects uh, have been a great example and a training location for people who have beaver conflict problems. We've got problems on private land. We've got problems on state and county roads with culverts and drainage systems. We've got problems on public parks. Beavers are equal opportunity nuisance animals in many cases. So we are working to train more people to tackle these problems in a sustainable way. My name is Alyssa Chat, and I work for the Clark Fork Coalition as a Beaver Conflict Resolution Field Specialist. And last year we did a workshop that involved Deer Lodge County Roads, Montana, transportation, fish, wildlife, and parks, various nonprofits, and some UM students to address nuisance beaver concerns. This year we're working with Deer Lodge County, Missoula County, Lewis and Clark County, various private landowners through Blackfoot Challenge, Five Valleys Land Trust, and also with Montana Rail Link. We're at Lost Creek State Park. This road culvert was being plugged by beavers, and the water level was being raised next to the road by about a foot. So it went from, it was here all the way up to there. And it was running, the water was running along the road and continually um, causing issues for park maintenance. This is a year post installation at this culvert. So here are the culvert edges, and then the intake or the pipe outlet goes through the intake of the culvert. But beavers have come and dammed along this edge of the fence, and that's okay. We knew that they were gonna come and do that. So we set the pipe at the level where we wanted the water to drain to. And so some of it's flowing over the dam, but most of it is being carried through the fence by this pipe. We installed a pond leveler at this pond 11 months ago. It's working really well. There's a road behind us that was being flooded out. So we dropped the pond level about 10 inches. We have several more of these plans with Deer Lodge County later in this season. Here's the pipe going through the dam. And then there's the intake out into the pond. This head gate exclusion fence took us about an hour and a half to make last October. It's made with cattle panels and T-posts but it keeps beavers out away and they're not damming at the head gate anymore. And it's lasted an irrigation season worth of buildup here. And so it's gonna take me about five or 10 minutes to clean it off, but it's still functioning as intended, even with a little bit of buildup. We're on the east side of Deer Lodge Valley of Perkins Gulch at the request of some ranchers. They leased this plot from DNRC and we're in the middle of an aspen grove that recently have beavers move back into the area and since they only have aspen to eat we're going to um, 
wrap some of the trees and then leave others for the beaver browse. But since it's only aspen, they could come in and um, literally wipe out the entire grove. But we're going to protect some trees and leave others um, for the beavers. The Clark Fork Coalition has been collaborating with the Deer Lodge Valley Conservation District for a number of years now on various projects. This one we're really excited about because simple technology that people can apply in lots of different scenarios from ranch scenarios like this irrigation ditch headgate to uh, roads, culverts, state properties, county properties, infrastructure, everything in the rural environment that's affected by beavers. So we're interested in getting more information out to the public about this technology and that's part of what this project is about is training people and getting the word out that these pilot projects really work. All so right to, so I'm going to turn it over to you Alyssa I've stopped sharing. Yeah so I'm just going to talk and expand on a couple of the points that were made in that video too that this project is really about increasing tolerance and keeping beavers in place so we can have those really great benefits that they provide for watersheds. And um, our second major goal is to train our partners and organizations so that these devices can be implemented by a wide variety of agencies and nonprofits to kind of spread out this work in Western Montana and other watersheds as well. And most landowners I've spoken with are willing to live, live with beavers as long as they're not causing damage. I'm in contact a lot with Tori Ritter and other FWP officials to identify where conflicts are occurring and then kind of set up with landowners um, a way to move forward and figure out a way to coexist with beavers if they choose to go the non-lethal route. And I'm in Mike Callahan's Beaver Corps class learning from his mentoring and advice on how to properly install these and do site assessments um, and design these devices to be set up for success. And, work in these watersheds out here we have in the West. And so working with a wide variety of agencies and roads departments and organizations such as land trusts and watershed groups to provide trainings and installations and um, how to identify beaver sign, how to work with landowners to spread out these techniques. And I found that hands-on installations are really beneficial to have groups out, whether that's the county road crews or nonprofits. We did an installation, a culvert installation on Monday with um, Deer Lodge Valley County Road Crew and the Big Hole Watershed Committee. And so uh, it was a great hands-on training opportunity. And we have another culvert installation going in tomorrow as well. Um, and so just, we really want this project to be a resource for landowners and agencies and departments to address nuisance beaver concerns, keep beavers in places where they're appropriate, recognizing that a wetland isn't going to be appropriate in every single place that beavers try to build them. But for those areas that can support beavers and have the great habitat, um, we're going to use these devices um, where we can and train our partners and other organizations. So our project helps with everything from the very first site assessment to permitting to device design and finally to installation. And we can help purchase materials as well for landowners through our cost share program. It's modeled after Defenders of Wildlife electric fencing program that they have for grizzly bears here in Montana. And Aaron Hall has mentioned that they do cost share as well down in Colorado. And so it's a way to help landowners so that cost isn't a prohibitive factor for living with beavers. But what I really love about this work is that we have wildlife and humans and somewhere in the middle is inevitably conflict, but in the middle of wildlife and humans is also the opportunity to coexist. And these devices really provide those opportunities for coexistence. So thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Alyssa. I'm gonna pull, I had you um, spotlighted, I'm gonna pull you off. Um, all right, so we do have one more um, presenter who we had brought on for you guys to hear from, and that is Tori Ritter, the non-game 
or, um, biologist here at Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks on this part of the state. Tori is an all around ex beaver expert and um, I'm gonna turn it over for him to share. There's lots of questions in the Q&A we're hoping to get to. Um, I do recognize that we had a little bit of a technical glitch at the beginning there trying to go live on Facebook. And so we may run just a few minutes over trying to get to those questions. Um, but we'll jump in on those as soon as Tori is finished. Go ahead, Tori. All right, thank you. Let's see if I can get this to work. How's that look? It looks great. Okay. Well, um, I'm Tori Ritter. I work for Montana Fish, Life and Parks, the state fish and game agency here in Montana. Um, and before I get started, I just really want to acknowledge uh, Defenders of Wildlife, Clark Fork Coalition, and National Wildlife Federation. Um, they received a lot of input both from state and federal agencies and nonprofits and individuals that, you know, conflict situations with beavers was a really big uh, potential hurdle or hindrance to more widespread beaver restoration. Um, they heard that feedback and immediately started implementing this program. And it's a big effort to take on, but uh, really, really extremely important, uh, which is kind of what I'll be talking about. So I wanted to zoom out a little bit and sort of talk about how this conflict resolution stuff fits in with the overall picture of beaver restoration on the landscape. Um, so from the uh, Fish and Wildlife Agency side, we're really dealing with uh, three sides of the same beaver. Beavers are a fur bearer, they're also a steward of uh, streams and riparian areas. Um, and of course, as we've been talking about, they can also be a big nuisance species. So as a fur bearer, um, that is a, a recreational pursuit, just like hunting and fishing. And there's also people that make uh, at least part or sometimes all of their livelihood off of beaver trapping. That's by selling furs, selling castor oil, um, and also getting paid to deal with conflict issues with beavers. Um, we will always need trappers around to help with beaver management because uh, there will always be situations where um, beavers are causing conflict and it can't be dealt with uh, other than getting the beavers out of there. That will always occur and if we're really successful with beaver restoration on a large scale, that need may actually increase. So having trappers, experienced trappers around to respond to those incidents quickly is really, really important in the overall um, goal of beaver restoration. Um, be, you know, trapping and, and fur bear trapping is also a really important management option, as I just talked about. And then also uh, fur bear trapping is really important for research. We got to get a really good data out of um, trapping, and sometimes it's the only data we get on certain species. Um, so this is a, an important part of uh, beavers and beaver management in general, but also fits in with uh, beaver restoration because of being able to deal with those conflict issues. Now the side of beavers I like to talk about the most is uh, beavers as a steward of stream and riparian resources. Uh, beavers capture sediment, they can help rebuild floodplains, reestablish the connection between a stream channel and the floodplain, which is hugely important, not only for wildlife habitat, but also for um, storing water on the landscape, releasing that water slower throughout the year, providing uh, greater quantities and quality of water, uh, especially late in the season during dry years. And of course that, manipulation of sediment and water comes together to create some of the uh, most biologically rich and diverse habitats that we have in all of the western United States uh, surrounding these beaver colonies. And of course this is really really important because we live in a dry part of the country in the western United States where our streams and riparian areas make up a teeny tiny percent of the landscape yet are the the critical conduits through which our snow melt flows and the timing intensity of runoff each year and the melting of that snow has major implications on how bad droughts will be later in the year. So if we can take these little slivers of green running through the landscape and make them as robust and, and healthy and functional as possible, that provides a lot more water resources, a lot more wildlife habitat, and really has ecosystem scale impacts. Unfortunately, a lot of those little ribbons of green are in uh, pretty bad shape. Um, and this is mostly from long-term historical impacts with the widespread removal of beaver, followed by really, really intense livestock grazing outside of, uh, you know, modern range management that we have now. It's basically led to hundreds and thousands of miles of stream across the United States that are functioning way below their ecological capacity. 
um, and that the scale of this degradation is is kind of is mind-boggling at times. It is massive and it is very widespread. And the most common source of degradation is channel incision, where the stream cuts down into the floodplain to the point where even during very high waters, that water is not escaping out onto the floodplain and uh, causing those sorts of natural processes that streams and rivers need in order to function at that higher ecological state, in order to store water and to create wildlife habitat. They need to be able to get out of these sort of what they've become really is just glorified irrigation ditches. The water moves through very quickly. It doesn't stay on the landscape very long and it doesn't provide a lot of the ecosystem services we need. Now, fortunately, beavers are one of the best agents for recovering in sized streams because they capture sediment in the floodplain, uh, can expand the wetted area of the stream, can expand riparian vegetation. Uh, this is the same stream. On the left, we have uh, the incised portion with no beaver activity. On the right is an incised portion with beaver activity. And you can already see pretty clearly the changes that are happening with beavers in there. And if we can provide beavers the context and the space to be able to do their good work in these types of streams, they can take this seemingly insurmountable issue of having thousands and thousands of miles of stream that are in this degraded state, and they can really address it at a meaningful scale if we are able to sort of partner with beavers uh, to allow them to move into areas of their historic range where they can do this really good work. And hopefully bring it from something like this, a very simplified channel, barely taking up any part of its floodplain, to something like this. And maybe that's, this is kind of an extreme example, uh, but certainly this riparian area is storing a lot more water and providing a lot more wildlife habitat than that previous example. Um, so if we really want to attack this, this problem of stream degradation at a meaningful scale, beavers are a great partner to do that. Unfortunately, the third side of beavers is what we've been talking about today, and that is that they are a major nuisance. The same thing, the same engineering capability that makes beavers really, really good at creating wildlife habitat and drastically modifying the hab habitats they live in is the same thing that makes them really good at causing a lot of damage and, uh, and, and time and money and energy in a really short period of time. So this is not trivial, it's, it's something that is very, very important to address. So before this talk, I went through to the major publications that uh, you know, reached out to people with surveys or interviews to look at public and private land manager um, attitudes towards beavers. And this is kind of the big takeaways from those studies. Overall, people do have a pretty positive view of beavers. Uh, they're well aware of the positive impacts. But if you're someone that deals with damage issues, not surprisingly, that positive view goes down very, very quickly. And these conflicts, especially flooding of property and plug and irrigation infrastructure, are almost always cited as the number one concern among landowners and land management agencies relevant to beavers and beaver restoration. And in general, these conflict issues are, have not been adequately addressed when it comes to beaver restoration projects or beaver reintroduction projects. They're usually addressed sort of afterwards and more, or more in a reactionary way. So all of this is really just to say that beavers as a restoration tool, trying to restore beavers to areas of their historic range and the conflict beavers cause are intimately intertwined. There is no separating the two. If you're gonna be successful at beaver restoration, you're gonna have more conflict issues. So if you're not addressing those, that decreases the tolerance for beavers on the landscape, that decreases the tolerance for beaver restoration and it really can't uh, achieve that sort of landscape scale that it needs to be for really meaningful uh, restoration and change. So how do we deal with this nu nuisance beavers? Uh, the most common way, uh, at least historically, has been to just trap the beavers out. And that provides immediate results, gets the beavers out of there right away, but it's generally short term. I've been asking a lot of people that have, have used this technique sort of how long it's lasted. And usually it's one to five years and then the beavers are back doing the same thing and you have to get them trapped out again. Uh, so kind of the minimum estimate in Montana is if a trapper is gonna travel within 50 miles and trap out four beavers, uh, that's about $300 for whoever's paying for that. Now if that, and that's a minimum. So you can imagine that recurring over and over again every three years or so that can start to add up really quickly and compare that to cost of some of these non-lethal techniques, uh, they can be a lot more efficient. And of course, this can also be very dis destructive and upsetting to some parts of the, the human population. So why not trap those beavers live trap and move them somewhere else? Well, that does happen. And, but the opportunity for that is fairly limited because usually when there's a damaged situation, those beavers need to be moved right now, very quickly. 
and we don't always have a restoration site ready for them to be dropped off in. And that is because most of the areas that are left for beavers to occupy need some sort of uh, human intervention in order to bring that habitat to the point where beavers can occupy it readily. Uh, so there's limited opportunity for that and uh, you know as with all the reintroductions there's a fairly low success rate and beavers are no different. So that's why these techniques we've been talking about today are really really important because they're kind of the the in-between. It allows beavers to either stay in an area and not cause the damage issue or it gets them to just keep moving. If they can't get the water deep enough or if they can't harvest those trees because they're fenced now that just keeps that dispersing beaver moving rather than them constantly getting hung up and trapped out of the same area. And that has major implications, this non-lethal management stuff does, both on the social realm and the ecological realm. On the social side, this builds tolerance for beavers on the landscape. It's very similar to up in the Blackfoot here in Montana, we were dealing with a lot of grizzly bear issues, getting into grain silos, getting into trash cans. So we, so we you know, started cost sharing electric fences and bear-proof containers and that has allowed for landowners to be more tolerant of having grizzly bears around. It's very much the same thing for beavers. We need to have tolerance for beavers on the landscape so that there will be tolerance for increasing the extent and the, the, the number of beavers within suitable habitat. And that has ecological ramifications as well. And it takes away those potential sinks on the landscape where beavers move into area, get trapped out, get removed, more beavers move in, they get trapped out, they get removed. And it kind of turns that sink into more of like a, a corridor and I, I've used the term tolerance corridor before. It's basically a way to keep that dispersing segment of the population moving on the landscape and rather than getting hung up and then those dispersers which are really really important for occupying some of those unoccupied areas of their historic range where we want them to do good work that can keep those dispersers moving and that's uh, a really important segment of the beaver population that we need on the landscape to reach these new areas. So this non-lethal stuff is uh, again, intimately tied with restoration and uh, a really, really important thing to address and to provide landowners and agencies and county and city governments the tools and the expertise necessary to deal with these types of issues um, rather than, you know, sort of hitting the panic button and immediately getting a, a trapper to come in and remove the beavers. Again, there will always be a need for that, but I think these non-lethal management techniques um, could have a lot of room to expand and really do some great work in the beaver realm. So I think I went over. Always give me a call or email me if you have questions or concerns about beavers. I love talking about beavers. I put that stuff in every slide and I've never been overwhelmed with uh, people calling me or emailing me. So always do. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Tori. And your time um, was fine. We are at um, 12 o'clock, but I know that um, we discussed this earlier, people who were presenting. If you guys all want to pop onto the screen really quick, we'll take just um, maybe five minutes here to get to some of these questions. If your question is not answered today, again, feel free to reach out to our presenters. Um, I'll give their contact information again in just a moment here. Um, but some of the questions that came on that I thought were interesting and maybe you all could speak to, um, one was a little bit about the regulatory approvals required for in-stream coexistence tools um, in your perspective areas. So what are kind of the red tape things that you need to be thinking about to be installing these in-stream structures? And go ahead and just jump on if you have an answer or some insight into that. Uh, I think here in Montana, the, any concerns are addressed through the permitting process. And so that's, um, I like to talk with the fish biologists ahead of time if they have any concerns or if there's any species of concerns like bull trout or Western West Slope cutthroat trout. Um, and if there's any passage concerns or whatever the fish biologists might have, but every device that goes in a stream, at least in Montana, has to have a permit. And so it's either a SBA 124 permit if it's on public land or a 310 permit for private land. And so the private land ones get funneled through conservation districts, but again, it all goes before a board and there's a process to discuss impacts, whether that's sedimentation or um, fish passage issues, what the impacts might be on vegetation, but all of those things are kind of worked out and addressed within the permitting process. Thank you. Erin, do you have any insight from Colorado on what people need to be looking at? 
Yeah, we're a little behind in our permitting processes here. The state is still trying to figure that out. So there's no consistent permitting processes. We have to check with your local and regional um, people to, to get at that. Awesome, thank you. So more on a local local case by case basis there. Um, looking at other questions, um, we had some, let's talk about, um, this one was kind of interesting about water appropriation and water rights laws. Um, are those, do those come into play when beaver are repopulating an area or allowed to really establish in an area via one of these techniques? I can speak a little bit to that. So here in Colorado, water rights are a huge issue uh, and beaver definitely come into that. Uh, quite a bit. Um, not so much with these flow devices and coexistence structures, more so on the relocation side of things where you're establishing new beaver populations or in the restoration side of things where you might be installing like beaver dam analogs which mimic beaver dams. Uh, water rights issues definitely come into play in, in both of those cases and again the state is still finalizing policies on all of that. And uh, I'm not uh, very, very familiar within Montana, but I know that it is actually an ongoing um, discussion amongst those that work on those types of permits and works on water rights issues, exactly how all of these techniques, techniques fit in. Um, certainly if beavers are colonizing an area naturally, uh, that is not something that requires a permit, but a lot of what we're looking to do is to encourage beavers to colonize an area naturally, and that can get a little hazy um, depending on the level and type of beaver dam analog that you might be using if you're using them um, and those sorts of things where you're impounding water uh, does require consideration of water rights and water appropriation permitting. Um, but I don't know if I should or could go into much more detail than that without uh, some assistance. I think I think that's a great point, Tori. Is that yes, it is something to be to be thinking about, and something to maybe be looking for more assistance, more information on if you're if you're experiencing that. Um, go ahead, Mike. What, yeah, just want I want to add one thing. Education goes a long way because often when pe beavers are initially building a dam, the flow decreases downstream, obviously. But once that dam is built, whatever water is coming in is going to get downstream. And in the meantime, th as much water as they can see, there's even more water being stored in the earth. And that's all going to release, as you folks have talked about, over time when they need it more. So it's like a bank account. So trying to help people to understand that this is actually in their long-term interest, best interest is a good thing. Yeah, and on that note about education, several people asked Mike about um, your Beaver Institute and upcoming Beaver Corps trainings. Do you um, have any information on that we can put out there? This Beaver Corps training, you guys, is a great um, way if you're looking to use non-lethal techniques, looking to become involved um, more in beaver management, a great place to start. And so, Mike, what do you have upcoming? Uh, the nice thing is, is that pro the Beaver Corps training program is built to be done remotely at a person's own pace. So there, we typically will admit one new person a month just due to labor. You know, we're all volunteers, so it's uh, there's a limited amount of time that we can. Um, they can put into uh, training people. But uh, right now we have 24 people around the uh, US and Canada we're training. And if they go to the website, beaverinstitute.org, and you can contact us through that and say you're interested in the Beaver Corps training. And we'll, we'll send you all the information about it, the syllabus and what, you know, what, uh, what's involved and the costs and all that. So yeah, be happy to uh, you know, reply to anyone who's interested. Awesome, thanks Mike. Um, we have added that Beaver Institute link um, in the comments, so attendees, you should be able to see that. I'll flash it up again here in just a minute. Um, one question and maybe a great closing um, comment 
prompt for all of you guys who joined us. First of all, I'd like to thank all of the attendees who joined. We had a great turnout, which is so exciting for everybody involved in the work to see the level of interest that's out there. And um, thank you to you guys as panelists. I know you are generating a lot of that interest just on the good work that you're doing. I'd like to give you a chance to kind of close um, and sign off. If um, panelists, if you wanna stay on, um, turn your video on and stay off for a quick debrief, um, that would be great. But for closing comments, what are the big issues regar um, regarding this non-lethal um, conflict resolution right now? What are your closing thoughts that you wanna leave people with? And we can just go in the order that we presented, Mike, Aaron, Alyssa, and then Tori. Okay, um, I would say the two biggest issues are getting people to know that these non-lethal options are effective and that, and then getting people trained to be able to put them in properly. Because a lot of people over the years have done their own devices and not necessarily built or designed well, and it gives them all a bad name. But when it's done right, you know, in my business, Beaver Solutions, we guarantee them. So we, we want people to be putting in good devices that will work for years and years and years. And so, yeah, contact us and we'll uh, send you the information. Yeah, same thing for me. I'd echo what Mike said. It's all about education and outreach, letting people know that these solutions exist and when they're most appropriate, and then connecting them to the resources like, like Mike's organization you know, to really you know, do, this thing, do these things properly so that we have more successes on the landscape which just leads to more successes. Uh, if anyone ever wants to chat with me, you have my contact info, always happy. Yeah, I have nothing new to add to that. I just, <laughs> um, just making sure that these devices are installed properly and um, kind of removing that doubt that people have around these techniques and if they work or not. And so, yeah, just working with landowners and developing designs and using materials that are going to work and last in our watersheds here in Western Montana. Um, yeah, and I'm always happy to chat beavers as well. So thank you. Um, I would, yeah, I would echo the exact same thing that installing them correctly and having ones that work well and showing other people those ones that work well is, is a huge part of this. And then I also just wanted to emphasize the idea of, you know, this idea of dealing with conflicts being an integral part of planning and implementing restoration projects so that you're identifying those potential sites way before any beavers move in, way before any beaver dam analogs are built. You know potentially where those uh, conflict sites are going to be and you can talk to those landowners and, and be ready to get in there and install a device if or when it happens. Um, so I just wanted to kind of emphasize that idea of being proactive about it rather than constantly trying to, you know, chase around these problems after they've already flooded a road or already somebody's basement is full of water. Um, so that's it. And thank you for having me. Awesome. Excellent points. Again, um, presenters, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen right now so that um, those who are still in attendance can have another chance to look at who we had today and how to get in touch with them if you want. Um, again, we will be sending out some information as a follow-up to everybody who attended, including a link so that you can revisit this webinar, a recording of this. Um, we will include some links to these project pages so you can follow along, learn even more about the on the ground projects that everyone has going on. Thank you so much for joining us um, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And we will um, sign off and thank you.